In 1991, after almost 70 years as a single-party state run by the Communist Party, the Soviet Union collapsed and 15 new countries emerged. While some commentators hailed the transition as one of the great success stories of 20th century politics, others have focused on the devastating consequences for health. Across the region, the transition had an immediate and largely adverse impact on health. UNICEF attributed more than 3 million premature deaths to this rapid change. Over 10 million men are missing because of this system change, according to the United Nations Development Program. The life expectancy of men in these countries fell dramatically from 65 to 55 years, within a few years. And it was a puzzle because nobody knew why it was normally after a war, after the end of an empire, you have um, lots of de death because of infections, because all the systems are breaking down and people get infected and die. But this was a mortality crisis on the basis of not infection, but um, basically cardiovascular diseases, heart, stroke. And this was a very new type of health crisis but very deep, it was, uh, you could see tens of thousands of men dying, not with 68, but with uh, 45. At the same time, in some of the republics, you had a collapse of the healthcare system. So those people who had been dependent on healthcare, for example, people with insulin-dependent diabetes, uh, were no longer able to get their medications and we saw a rapid increase in deaths from diabetes. We also saw a breakdown of the disease control systems, so we saw an upsurge in deaths from tuberculosis. We saw an epidemic of diphtheria. We saw malaria coming back into some of the southern republics like Tajikistan and Azerbaijan from where it had previously been eradicated. It was clear that more information was needed to fully understand why the transition was having such a devastating impact on health. So 10 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, a group of researchers funded by the European Commission undertook a new project. Their study was unlike any that had taken place in the region before, and it was named Living Conditions, Lifestyles and Health, or the LLH. In the years following the LLH project, the situation in these countries changed considerably, although not in a consistent way. Most of their economies were growing, and, in some cases very rapidly, as a consequence of exploiting natural resources such as oil. However, the benefits were not shared by all, and though the share of households living below the poverty line has fallen since the early 1990s, incomes have become much more unequal. The researchers wanted to monitor the changes that were occurring in the region in terms of health status, behaviours and lifestyles, so they embarked on a follow-up project. It was led by the Institute of Advanced Studies in Vienna, the University of Aberdeen, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, but it involved 13 partner organisations in total, nine of which were from the study countries. It was again funded by the European Commission, and it was called Health in Times of Transition, the HIT. The HIT study fills a very important gap in providing information about exposure to smoking, alcohol consumption, um, diet and nutrition, but more than that, this is a very innovative study in that it also has information on the communities in which people live, their living conditions, so we can look not just at the causes of disease, but the causes of the causes of disease. The HIT followed a similar outline to the earlier LLH project to allow comparability, but it also made use of new methodologies. So alongside the repeated household surveys, the researchers analysed the communities where people live, perceptions of health among adults and children, media influences, tobacco and alcohol industries, and the health systems of these countries. And this was a pioneering study, huge household survey uh, in uh, all in post-Soviet countries, uh, approximately 2,000 respondents per country, 18,000 respondents uh, everywhere. Uh, we implemented a series of uh, focus groups about health and healthy lifestyles uh, in Russia, Ukraine and, uh, and, and Belarus, including Chernobyl area, it was very topical, series of expert interviews and so on. 
исследование, как и во всех, как и у всех других стран участников проектов, состояло из количественного и качественного исследования. Это был массовый опрос по репрезентативной общенациональной выборке по различным вопросам, связанным со здоровьем, политикой, образом жизни, социально-политическими вопросами. Также это были фокус-группы, как часть качественного исследования, а также community profiles. The results of the household surveys and community profiles provide us with an understanding of key issues for the region, such as tobacco, mental health and access to care. The household survey collected comprehensive data on smoking in the region, the determinants of tobacco use, public knowledge of tobacco's health impacts and public opinion on tobacco control. Smoking in the region is widespread. Around half of males are smokers and female smoking rose rapidly following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Contrary to what is often claimed, the household surveys uncovered substantial support for stronger tobacco control measures. Almost 80% of people thought authorities were not effective enough or could do more to fight against smoking. More than half thought tobacco prices should increase, and almost everyone supported some form of restriction on smoking in social spaces, with over a third supporting a total ban. The survey also revealed very poor knowledge of the health impacts of smoking. A third of respondents did not know that smoking causes heart disease and bronchitis. Although tobacco companies claim that smokers make an informed choice to smoke and are aware of the health risks, the results showed that smokers were significantly less likely to know the health risks than non-smokers or former smokers. These results are further supported by the photographs that were taken as part of the community profiles. We also took detailed photographs of, of the packets of tobacco in, in these communities and then did detailed analysis of how those packets conform or often do not conform to national legislation and international legislation. So what the, the photographs of the cigarette packets also provided was really interesting information around prices and the exceptionally low prices, which goes against all recommendations regarding tobacco products. So in some areas, tobacco products and packets of cigarettes were as low as a packet of chewing gum. The photographs also revealed the, the ways in which tobacco companies are still using misleading labels on cigarette packets such as lights or miles, which again goes against many international agreements and national agreements from the government. And so this provided objective proof of the way in which these misleading labels uh, are still being used across the region. Alongside tobacco use, alcohol consumption is one of the main causes of ill health and premature death in the region. Another key part of the HIT project was a stakeholder analysis which explored public debates on the regulation of alcohol and tobacco, the players involved and the positions they defend. What's meant by stakeholder analysis? You try to understand who is influencing the tobacco and alcohol market and in what way and what are their goals, uh, what are their KPIs, uh, who, who pays them to do it. Um, how influential they are. So that's what you're trying to map. But um, actually the research we've done was slightly broader because we looked at um, not just at stakeholders, but we did uh, analysis of the um, uh, public opinions of, uh, of the legislation, etc. So it was slightly broader scope, I would say. The stakeholders included the alcohol and tobacco industries, governments including the ministries of health, finance, trade and agriculture, NGOs and experts sponsored by and independent from industry. So what were the findings of the stakeholder analysis and how can they be used to influence policy? Vodka is something so Russian, it doesn't get any more Russian than vodka. <laughs> so how do you make sure that people don't drink in huge quantities and um, don't kill themselves by doing so. Uh, and obviously the alcohol producers, the local ones, they have a lot of lobbying powers. Um, uh, it's an important part of the economy. And uh, all of those countries uh, we've done the stakeholder analysis in, they're struggling because they want uh, to achieve economic growth, they want GDP to, to double in five years, etc. And it's very hard once you're starting to choke even some industries, even the marginal ones. And alcohol and tobacco are not really marginal industries. They are quite uh, uh, part of the GNP and GDP, but they are hazardous part of that. So uh, wh whenever you basically 
read the laws, you see this this conflict uh, of interest uh, because on the one uh, hand the governments want economy to grow and they say oh that's that's an important part of the economy you can't just kill it and on the other hand they want to do something about health and it's it's a very hard trade-off so what heat contributes basically it shows what are the potential buttons uh, one could press uh, in order to shift this kind of trade-off towards health.